Hi students, welcome to this lecture on painting. We'll start with some learning objectives as always. So we'll start by distinguishing among early painting media. For instance, we'll cover encaustic, fresco as well as tempera paint. And then we'll move into oil and how this becomes such an innovative and distinctive type of painting as a medium, just around the 15th century. And then we'll discuss some of the advantages offered by artists who uh, more contemporarily in the modern period work with synthetic painting media. So to start, what is painting? Well, you've already seen the drawing lecture. Here, painting is just a form of drawing using brushes to apply color liquid to a support. Now a support can be, uh, you know, most commonly would be a canvas, uh, but paint can also uh, uh, be produced on paper, wooden panels, for instance, the Mona Lisa is on a wooden panel. Uh, metal plates or, of course, walls. And for walls, we basically are, can speak about fresco paintings in terms of walls. Paint is composed of three major ingredients, pigment, binders, and solvents. So depending upon the binder, you have the different types of paint. The pigment, of course, is just the color that is added. Most supports are too uh, absorbent to allow easy application, so you oftentimes have to prime uh, a support with a paint-like ground. The most common paint-like ground that we have that artists often use is called gesso. It's made from glue and plaster or chalk, so it has this white material to uh, white materiality to it. Um, it looks like white paint, but of course, the reason for this is because canvas, you know, as you see here, a stretched canvas, it's um, it's it's absorbent, right? It's basically like a, a thick type of cloth, so of course, it would absorb uh, paint. So, so that it doesn't absorb the paint, artists use gesso, this primer, to prime their paintings. So there's a thin layer of this white plaster chalk glue material. Um, and then of course, uh, that is what the paint will then sit on. So you have a solvent, and this is a thinner that allows paint to flow more, more readily, more easily. Often it's water-based, sometimes oil-based, depending on what kind of paint medium you're using. So now let's talk about uh, binders. So the uh, color pigments are often suspender, suspended in a sticky binder in order to apply it to a support. Um, binders might include, depending on the type of media, oil for oil paintings, wax for encaustic, and we'll get there in a second, uh, lime water and plaster. This is for a fresco painting. And then of course we have egg yolk, yolks used for tempera and, and so forth. But let's start with encaustic. So encaustic is one of the oldest forms of painting. It's basically made out of a pigment combined with hot wax. And so of course you all have experienced being around a candle. Um, you know that when the wax is hot, it's melty and liquidy and it flows versus when it's cold, it's going to you know, be hard and actually start to um, uh, be less malleable. So because of this, artists actually have to use, uh, uh, work relatively fast with uh, the encaustic uh, media because it dries, dries pretty quickly, right? When you blow a candle out, it doesn't take long for the wax to then harden. Um, so here's an artist working with it today. You see it is kept warm and the artist basically has uh, created different encaustic pigments. So using different pigments, blue, yellow, green, like you see here. Um, mixing those with wax and then to keep it warm they placed it inside of like a, a heating cooking um, um, kind of a utensil uh, uh, that you see here. Um, so that is of course because if it does get cold um, then it'll dry out and it won't be malleable. So the reason um, encaustic is important though is not because of this because obviously it makes it so that the artist has to move a little more quickly when they're painting um, but the advantage of it is that it does remain really fresh and vibrant over centuries. You can see that here with the mummy portrait of a man. Um, this is Egyptian uh, portrait from 160 of the Common Era. Um, and of course, you probably say to me, oh, it doesn't look all like it, uh, it, like it uh, withstood the time all that well. But really, these colors are quite vivid for being from seven, such an early period. And that is because of the encaustic paint. So encaustic requires the painter to work quickly, um, as I said, because the wax is about to dry. It doesn't take long for it to dry. Uh, the other really exciting thing about encaustic that excited uh, artists, you know, 
even contemporary artists are uh, still working in encaustic, um, are, uh, is its luminosity. The ability of it to be basically translucent and transparent. Um, so if you see wax, right, you can, if it's, a, if it's not colored, um, it's very see-through, and even colored wax, you can make a thin layer of it and have it be very see-through. Um, so there's been a recent revival of this. In fact, one of, our, uh, one of my colleagues here at South Texas College, um, if you happen to make it to uh, the faculty art show each year, his name is Scott Nickel. Um, he actually works with uh, encaustic paint, and he works with this waxy paint material. So if you want to see one of these, you might try to catch out, uh, catch, I catch the art, um, the STC faculty art show at some point. Um, but Jasper Johns is one of these artists as well. And the reason why he's really interested in using this, and this gets back to the things that were covered during week one when we spoke about active and passive scene. Well, Jasper Johns would say about his flag that it was seen but not examined, right? Seen but not seen, but not looked at, not really examined. So of course, this is the line between active and passive scene that we've already spoken about. Um, but beyond that, um, he thinks of the flag, of course, it's an important symbol. We all know it. Um, we don't have to look actively at it, right? It's kind of like a stop sign in that way. Obviously very different, um, but we know what it looks like. We know what's on it. We don't have to look closely at it to feel, to figure out that it's a flag, right? Um, but he's saying, okay, well, the, the flag is more nuanced and American history is more nuanced than that. So he's asking us to look more closely. And that's what we have to do here with his painting of the flag. Now this is also from the 50s, so this is during the Cold War. This is a time in history when Senator Joseph McCarthy, uh, you know, was uh, evoking a lot of anti-communism. There's uh, uh, McCarthyism in America. Of course, we were in the space race with Russia. So there's a lot of competition, um, and there's a, a lot of questions in terms of one's patriotism. So uh, uh, you have to be sure um, that you expose the fact that you are a patriot person so that you weren't actually uh, mistaken for a communist. Um, so this, the flag was increasingly important at this time, you know, uh, depictions of the flag and also people putting flags out to make sure that it was understood that they were patriots and that they weren't communists. Um, now, and if you look closely, you can actually see what J uh, Jasper Johns did is he embedded newspaper articles from the time that he was living in the 1950s uh, right into the flag to give it that nuanced quality to really make us look at it to see what is beneath it. So that's what you see here and encaustic works perfectly for this because it is like I said that thin waxy material that can be seen through in some respects. Of course I like to bring this one up. Um, it's come up in other lectures um, but this is a perfect study of complementary colors. Here's another work with Jasper Johns, uh, also working with a flag. So he created a painting or, or kind of a, a lithograph earlier with the same, the same color combo. Um, uh, but in 1965, he reproduces this color combo of the flag, places a white dot at the center of it. Of course, you're supposed to look directly at that white dot, so I'll give you a moment to do that. Um, but he reproduced this in the 1960s, in the late 1960s and 69 as a uh, anti-war poster. Um, so here saying, okay, the American flag has become green, black, and orange, kind of sickly colors. And of course, this is a time where uh, uh, people were wanting to get out of the, uh, the Vietnam War. They didn't see why it was uh, important and, and why we were even there. And so this was distributed at that time as an anti-war poster as well. Now you've been looking at it for a little while while I've, while I've been talking. Uh, keep looking straight at the screen. And then you probably saw something, you probably seeing something. Um, this is an after image, of course. These are the complementary colors of these colors are basically stored in your retina so that when you look away after looking at a, 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 a swatch of color for an extended period of time, of course your retina holds an after image and then kind of portrays that on whatever else you're looking at next. And so the artist is of course interested in complementary colors here, but also is interested in the optical illusion um, that is allowed by looking at something for an extended period of time like this. Um, now let's talk about frescoes a little bit. So frescoes were the preferred medium for wall painting. 
This is where pigment is mixed with a lime water and applied to a lime plaster wall. There's two different types of uh, fresco. One is buon fresco, one is fresco secco. These are Italian terms. Buon actually means good in Italian and secco actually means dry. So clearly artists saw the buon fresco, the wet fresco, as the better as they named it the good fresco. Here's some early frescoes from Pompeii and Herculaneum. These are two ancient Roman town, or sorry, ancient Italian towns. You might have heard of Pompeii. We'll talk about it later in the course. Um, this is that ancient town that was basically covered uh, by volcanic ash when Mount Vesuvius erupted um, back in 79. So basically, it's a very sad story. Everyone, every living creature in town was killed uh, very soon after it erupted. Um, However, um, on the bright side, I guess you could say, um, all the paintings and everything has been completely preserved um, uh, because it was covered in a volcanic ash for so long. So we do have these amazing fresco paintings on the walls all around Pompeii. So now let's look more closely at these two terms. So buon fresco, good fresco, uh, was painted on wet plaster. So you're using wet paint onto a wet plaster, but the, because of this, the artist has to work very quickly before the, the plaster dries. This allows the paint and the plaster, I'm sorry, the plaster, uh, and, yeah, the paint and the plaster to then kind of meld and become one. Of course, this is a good thing so that the painting doesn't crack over time. The other type of uh, fresco is a fresco secco or dry. This is done after the plaster has dried. So you're working on a dry wall with wet plaster. This means, you know, that they won't blend in such a way. The material, the plaster, won't blend with the fresco paint. Um, so this is nice for artists because they can work at a slower pace because uh, they don't have to worry about the plaster on the wall drying before they're done. However, there is a disadvantage to fresco secco, and that is that moisture can then creep in between the plaster and the paint so that there can be cracks. So the best paintings that best survive um, during from this time are the blown frescoes because the plaster which is wet and the paint which is wet they get to meld and then that uh, produces uh, more longevity for the fresco. Uh, typically we always seem to stay in Western Europe when we're talking about these kinds of things so I do want to move outside of that space uh, because I do I do want you to know that uh, artists far outside of wet, the West of Western Europe were using these techniques and using them wonderfully. So here if we go to central India, I have, um, <clears throat> this is um, a cave complex. It's a Buddhist cave complex. It's called the Caves at Ajanta. And if you go inside, and these are from 475 of the Common Era, you have a variety of obviously great, beautiful uh, Buddhist sculptures, but also on the walls, uh, and this was, a, uh, this was a place of worship. Obviously on the walls, you also have amazing frescoes. Um, of course, some of them have cracked over time, you know, perhaps some oxygen got in between the plaster and the paint when things were getting painted. Um, but for the most part, these really are preserved very well. Um, both of these figures, and we'll talk more about uh, Buddhist imagery later in the course, but both of these figures are what we call a bodhisattva. The term is here for you. Um, a bodhisattva is a person who's similar to the Buddha. Of course, we'll talk about Buddha, uh, Buddhist theory and uh, Buddhist philosophy later, um, but the Buddha was basically a, um, a prince who gave up everything and decided to go into a, a, a meditation in the wild for a while. He gave up all of his earthly belongings, and about seven years after doing that, he attained enlightenment. Um, and of course, thereafter, you know, uh, uh, he, um, people started to follow him in his ways. And then we have the formation of Buddhism. Well, these figures are similar to the Buddha. Um, however, they still have their earthly garb. They still have these amazing elaborate golden crowns. They're still tied to the world of the living um, because they're still interested in those kind of princely endeavors. But they're bodhisattvas. So they're, they're uh, people who have the ability to attain enlightenment like the Buddha, but instead through a selfless act, they remain on earth so that they can help those who need help attain enlightenment uh, and it, uh, move in the way of the Buddha as well. So these are bodhisattvas, um, and they're, of course, there uh, within the temple walls at Ajanta. Uh, as with anything, different geographies, uh, different cultures kind of uh, 
uh, change the way that they utilize uh, such techniques. So here you have fresco, but you also have layers of mud and straw, as well as gypsum or lime plaster, which is applied to the walls as well. Um, throughout this lecture, there's going to be a variety of other media that I'll post. These are things that would have come up in class if you were in a class setting. So there is a panorama that I'll post, uh, a little video that basically shows you around the caves. Um, for uh, Ajanta, there's also a video about the Scrovani Chapel, and we're going to talk about this just briefly. If we were in class, we would cover it more with the video, but of course I can't embed videos into YouTube videos because of copyright reasons. Um, but here you have a, a chapel that was a personal chapel by Giotto. He's an important early Renaissance uh, painter. Um, who was working right before a linear perspective was actually uh, produced, uh, but nonetheless he was known for his amazing frescoes. And um, there's a real interest in illusionism, so the sky is supposed to uh, signify um, actually a night sky, and then you have 38 individual scenes throughout the chapel on all the walls, which outline the lives of the Virgin and Christ. Another thing to note about this chapel, it was actually, um, it's a personal chapel by a fellow whose last name was Scrovani. He was a prominent baker, or I'm sorry, not banker, not baker, not a person who makes bread, a banker who worked in Padua, Italy. Um, at this time in history, it was actually a sin uh, to be a banker, basically. Uh, it was seen as a sin if you uh, collected interest, and that's what a banker does. So Scrovani made a lot of good money as a banker, and he knew that he was sinning, but he didn't want to give up the money. So he decided, maybe God will forgive me if I produce this beautiful chapel for him, right? Um, and this was obviously early corruption of the, the, the Roman Catholic Church, and we'll talk about this more later, especially when we talk about the, the Lutheran Reformation. Um, but of course, that's why you see this chapel being produced. And there's more on that in the supplemental video I posted as well. Another key term that we bring up in terms of uh, thinking about frescoes is what we call giornata. Giornata is an Italian term. Giorno, so if you say buon giorno, that means good day. And we already know that uh, um, a buon for buon fresco means good. Giorno means day. So you can use those terms, um, hopefully, to memorize these. So giornata means a day's work. Now this is what we call the sections of frescoes that are able to be completed in a single day. The thing about frescoes and many early types of paint is that artists actually mixed them themselves. So you, each day you might be mixing your own paint. You might be mixing your binder with whatever um, pigment or and solvent that you've decided to use. And so each day these might look a little different. You might add a little more blue than you did the day before or this or that. So because of this, it's interesting for us to look at paintings and be able to see the days, uh, the amount that was painted in a single day. So for this uh, example, the expulsion from paradise, this is Adam and Eve uh, being expel expelled from the Garden of Eden, another biblical story by Masaccio, another Italian artist. Um, where you can see that Adam must have been uh, painted in one day, Eve was probably painted in another, you can see the line here, and the angel was probably uh, painted in the third day. Same goes for uh, uh, frescoes that we see at, uh, in um, the chapel at, uh, at the Scrovani Chapel. The angels have this, these spaces in between them too, which does again signify that um, uh, different sections are produced over uh, the span of different days. Of course, the most famous uh, kind of uh, fresco that you might know of is the creation of Adam from um, Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel ceiling. These frescoes um, basically make up the whole ceiling and the whole front and the whole, all, all the walls of, um, of um, the Sistine Chapel. I will post a panorama of this as well. It's really fun to look at. Oftentimes this painting is cropped by itself. And of course, sometimes the hands are cropped as well, but it's important to see that they exist much more broadly. Um, Michelangelo was not a painter. He didn't like painting. He felt uncomfortable painting. He was actually a sculptor. Um, so it's interesting that he spent so many years of his life working on this uh, famous commission that has now become so important. The one thing I do like to bring up here is that frescoes really do accumulate dust. So over time, over centuries, uh, wall paintings accumulate dust, smoke, grease, other things. Um, and historians used to just believe that the Sistine Chapel was basically um, 
it just kind of done in dull colors until recently when it was restored and we saw that actually the colors were incredibly vivid, um, but they had just been really dirty. So another way to bring up some kind of fun things that art historians can do, you know, can, you, can be, you can get a degree in restoration and um, from there you can do really important work where you just basically cleaning the gunk off of paintings like you see here. Tempera paint. So moving forward, tempera paint is made by combining water, pigment, and then a, basically a gummy material such as an egg yolk. Uh, these would dry really quickly, uh, they don't blend really easily, and they must be layered if you want any kind of uh, volume or kind of layer, uh, any, more, any kind of blending. Um, so they don't sound quite as fun as the oil painting we'll get to in a moment, but the oil, oil paintings were not invented until the 1500s. So at this point, really, if you see anything that's on a panel, it's going to probably be a tempera paint. So here's two really important tempera paintings, both of the same subject matter, but obviously about 100 years apart. Um, the one on the left is by uh, Cimabue, an Italian artist, and then the one on the right is by Giotto. Giotto is the artist that we just saw. He also did this Grovani Chapel. Both of these artists were extremely famous at the time, but you see they have very different styles and very different ways of depicting the Virgin and Christ Child. A Chimebue is still kind of in the Byzantine style where we have a kind of almost a cutout of Mary. She doesn't seem like a real person. There's not real space depicted. She's very stylized. She's got elongated fingers, elongated torso. Um, she doesn't really seem like a real person, right? And the angels exist in this non-realistic space. Um, there's a gold background. This is very Byzantine, so it's more of a heavenly space. Uh, when we look at Giotto's representation, again, we still have that golden background, and it's only a hundred years later, but there's more of an interest in uh, space, and there's more of an interest in real space in which people are layered upon one another, so much so that some of their faces are actually obscure in some of the angels' faces. Uh, obviously, it's still before linear perspective is produced so or invented, so we don't really have a, a real attention to space using Geo, uh, geometric lines that recede to a vanishing point, another term we've talked about. Um, but nonetheless, you see a real interest in realism, less stylized, especially in the terms of Mary. So here she looks like uh, an everyday person you might find on the street. And of course, this is the story, the biblical story of Mary, is that she was a regular person before she came, became holy when she was um, uh, chosen by the angel Gabriel. Um, so she becomes more relatable in this painting for the first time. We really see her as someone we can pray to, someone who we can relate to outside of kind of her holy person. Um, so something to note here with these important paintings. And now, of course, there's vivid colors in the Giotto piece, but it's not until we get oil paintings where we really see an, a real interest in elaborate, vibrant colors. So here's Van de Heem, another artist, uh, a Northern European artist, who's using oil. And then, of course, we have that emphasis to bring another term into the course um, that we've already talked about. The emphasis here, it's right at the lobster. We have that vibrant color, and then the red basically surrounded by hues of green. So those are complementary colors. All of this used to emphasize the foreground with the lobster. So oil paint, this is discovered in the 15th century and it's discovered by Northern Europeans. So the Italians were not the ones who invented it. It was the Northern Europeans, the artists working uh, up in the Netherlands, Belgium, that area. Uh, this is used vegetable oils, linseed oil, walnut oil, and uh, other types of binding agents. These were much more versatile than tempera. They could be blended very easily on the painted surface, thinned out with turpentine, taken straight from the tube. You see some tubes here to create what we call an impasto, kind of textured technique to painting, like you see with Van Gogh, if you know his work. And then, of course, the most important thing about this for many artists um, was that it was slow to dry. So you didn't have to finish your work right at the time. You could come back to it over the next few days and work back into it because it wouldn't dry quickly. Here's an important piece of oil painting by Robert Campin. I'm sorry, not by him. Uh, we think of this as actually being by his workshop. So we used to think that this was by him, but now we know it's more likely that he had a workshop with apprentices and that his apprentices following his lead probably produced this triptych. A triptych is a painting that consists of three panels. This is a small altar piece that would have, uh, of course, sat on an altar in a church. 
It is another biblical scene. Uh, so I'm not presenting all these biblical scenes because I love biblical scenes so much, but rather because this is what the money was going towards at the time. These were the commissions that were being asked, uh, that were being made because the church had a lot of money and they spent a lot of money on art. Um, so here you have another biblical scene. This is the Annunciation. Um, if you know biblical history, uh, you know that here you have the Virgin at center, Joseph over here, the carpenter. These two people are actually the patrons. Um, oftentimes people who paid for paintings ask themselves to be included so that God knows to be gentle on them during Judgment Day because they commissioned this painting, right? Very corrupt. Um, so they're kneeling outside the door here. But here you have the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and letting her know that she will bear the Christ child, that she will have uh, undergo what we call immaculate conception. But the most important thing to note about this is the use of glazing. And this is something that we really only have available through the use of oil painting. So glazing is a, a, a technique that artists use with oil, which creates a sense of luminous materiality in oil paint by brushing a thin film of transparent color over a surface. And because of this, objects appear to reflect light. And this was something that was incredibly new and incre incredibly exciting. If you zoom in here, I mean, look at every single color, every single piece of the angel's hair seem to be reflecting light. The cauldron behind them, of course, all of this is uh, built, uh, they're built into this painting is a, an incredible amount of symbolism and iconography, something that we see the Northern Italians really interested in at this time. So uh, this shiny cauldron behind them, this is supposed to be a symbol of Mary's purity, um, basically because it is so pure itself. We also have the candle that's gone out. The biblical story goes that as the Holy Spirit comes into the room, and you see that personified here with the small person with the cross who comes in on light rays through the window. Um, the story goes that a candle goes out at that same time. And so you have the detail depicted here in the candle. Even the smoke is incredibly realistic and detailed. This is actually happens to a, what happens to a candle when you blow it out, right? You blow out a candle and a thin piece of smoke comes up and then it waves up and kind of comes back down on, on, on itself. Um, so incredible detail and incredible use of light and luminosity here with the use of oil, with the use of oil paintings. We really don't have that with other media. Uh, moving forward into the 20th century, we have what we call synthetic, synthetic media. This is where chemicals are treated, uh, chemically treated pigments and paints were uh, basically used as, as painting media. Um, these became readily available in the 20th century, so modern artists. We have these three Mexican artists who were seen as the, the best of the best with this type of material. They were called Los Tres Grandes at the time, Siqueiros, Orozco, and then Rivera, you see over um, on the right side. You might have heard of Diego Rivera when you've been, uh, if you've ever heard of um, Frida Kahlo, of course, you likely have. These two were in a, a difficult and contentious relationship for a number of years. But nonetheless, these Mexican painters, they were absolutely innovative when they were working at the turn of the century and into uh, the 20s and 30s as they worked with synthetic media. Uh, they were the first to use peroxylin. Now, this is an automobile paint, but they used it because it worked really well outdoors. So oil paint didn't really work outdoors, right? It doesn't slow, it doesn't dry very slowly, and this doesn't work well with uh, the ways in which outdoor paintings are exposed to the elements. So you would need something else. So these artists were Works with some, worked with synthetic media to create these huge murals like Diego Rivera, Rivera's from uh, the 1930s. And of course, there's another video I'll post about this online as well. Um, when we talk about painting, it's also important to, and synthetic media, it's also important to reference Jackson Pollock's piece, uh, his pieces. He was an action paper painter. He was also known as an abstract expressionist, but within that group, um, he was one of the painters who was extremely active. Um, he would per basically um, engage in uh, moving around his painting, which he would put the canvas on the floor, he would splatter on it, pour paint on it in a variety of ways, um, and really engage in an active process. That's why we call it active painting. Um, he would drip and pour. He was also a smoker, so you can find cigarette butts in his paintings. You can find his footprints in his paintings, right? And some people think, well, these are such a mess. This is an art. Well, you know, at the time, no one was doing that. And so part of the reason these are so famous and so important now is because really he's the first one to actually take uh, the canvas off of the 
um, off of uh, the easel and place it on the floor and uh, involve the process, right? the active process of making as part of the work. Here's another image of him uh, doing a large scale painting. And then of course these would go on the wall and hang up as well. We'll talk more about the abstract expressionist and Jackson Pollock's uh, works in later lectures when we talk about abstract expressionism. Um, but uh, just to note, a lot of these paintings at this time were, I uh, had ambiguous uh, names. This is number 32. So it's not meant to give you meaning um, because it's not representative. It doesn't actually show anything that we can recognize. It's completely abstracted. And that is because it's more about emotion and not about conveying an object. It's about the paint itself. So paint for paint sake and we'll get back to that at a later, at a later lecture. Um, there's other artists who follow in uh, Pollock's footstep uh, steps. Helen Frankenthaler is one of them, another artist who's literally pouring uh, on uh, paint, uh, you know, using binder um, that is super liquidy, like even water, um, onto an unprimed canvas, allowing a stain to take place, right? Not using that gesso to protect the canvas, but rather staining the canvas by just pouring stuff on it and then manipulating her pores a little bit. But also her and Pollock were really interested in spontaneity, so the ability of chance. So you throw paint at a painting, you're not exactly sure how it's going to land. You pour paint onto a painting, you're not sure how it's going to pour, right? So there's a bit of spontaneity here with her stain gestures. Um, and the last piece that we'll talk about today with synthetic media, of course, is aerosol, so graffiti art. Um, it, it has been linked to criminality, but it's interesting for our, us art historians now to think about it in a broader context because most of these uh, graffiti artists have now been invited into the gallery space. So even though it was seen as uh, basically graffiti art is produced in public space, it is something that you put out there in the elements it's produced quickly because, you know, you will be criminalized if you're uh, found it to be doing it. It's actually illegal in most places. Um, so it's something that has to be done fast, um, but it's also something that uh, uh, is supposed to be uh, temporal. So it might not last forever. Someone might come and add something to it or paint on it over it completely. And so where does uh, it belong now, now that it's been invited into the gallery space and now that artists who so much of their work as graffiti artists has been tied to outdoors and the city and external spaces are now being invited into the gallery space and invited into the traditional art scene. So this is a, a graffiti building at Five Points that used to exist, um, basically became a mecca for graffiti artists. It's an abandoned building, but the guy who owned it didn't really care. So he let it become this kind of amazing graffiti mecca, which of course made a lot of people come here. Uh, it basically, uh, it became a tourist space. So more money's coming into the city, right? Uh, little coffee shops, of course, rent is raising. This all comes together. And this is what we call gentrification. And so what happens then? Well, also the building, uh, the, the the guy who owns it starts thinking, well, I can make a lot of money if I actually sold this and made it into a condo because people want to live here now. But of course, it's a feedback loop that doesn't work, right? Um, people want to live here because it's a graffiti mecca. And now it's a very trendy place to live. Uh, but what happens when you get rid of the five points, this very trendy thing in the area? Well, they tried to save it. Uh, they couldn't save it. Basically, one night, all the artists were trying to come together and save it. And then one night, the owner uh, paid people to go whitewash it at night. So it wasn't saved. Um, it no longer exists. But it is something I'd like to bring up. Um, also, because it's a uh, sad story of gentrification. Um, anyway, on that note, that's all I have for you today. Let me know if you have questions about this lecture on painting. And I will see you next week.